This past week, I, uh, Heather and I tried out a new restaurant. You see, I actually woke up that morning. It was Thursday morning. Thursday morning, I woke up and I was like, babe, I want, like the first thing that came out of my mouth, I want this particular food. I won't give you details because I don't want to give away all the details. But I said, I want this food. We should try this restaurant that we've never been to. And so we get to the restaurant and I made a crucial mistake. I learned two lessons in this, this little incident. The first one is when you wake up craving something, and you show up to the restaurant to get that something, order that something. But I got distracted by this beautiful menu of these different items. I thought, that's something new, I'm gonna try that. And while it was good, it did not hit the spot. And so I said, this is good. I like this. I'm eating this. But my wife knew the whole time that I wasn't enjoying this. I never said I wasn't enjoying it. I never said this was terrible, I don't like this. I mean, it was good, it just wasn't what I would want, what I, what I woke up for. It wasn't, it wasn't just my thing at that moment. And, and so we get in the car and I'm like, okay, babe, I got to admit, now that we're not in the restaurant, wasn't my favorite. It just wasn't. And she's like, I know. I look at her like, how dare you say you know? How do you know? I didn't say anything. I was communicating good, positive things about this dish. And she says, I know, 20 years of marriage, Jerome. I'm like, what does 20 years of marriage mean? That you could read my brain? She goes, no, but I could read your body language. I could read the nonverbals. I could read the, lacks, the lack of, mm, I guess, is what she was saying. And then about 10 seconds later, in the car, still leaving the restaurant, I said, and I'm going to spare you from the details of this argument because you, you guys know too much about our own personal life. But it was a directional issue. And I made a statement. And she didn't agree with my statement because she didn't understand what I said with my mouth. And I thought to myself, how can you understand things that I don't say when I'm trying not to communicate something, but when I'm trying to plainly communicate verbally, it's somehow lost. Can I get an amen from the married guys in the room? Okay, I'm just checking. It's not just me? Oh, that's good. So my first lesson is order what you crave, what you woke up for, order what you went to that restaurant for. The second lesson is this, and maybe this is just a personal lesson, but I was awakened to my, mis my ability to miscommunicate and not be clear in what I say. And because of that inability, let me go back to last week's message because I want to clarify something that I said last week. You remember last week we were in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, where Paul writes to the church and says, be thankful in what? All things, all circumstances. Now you remember, you may remember that I said that we find ourselves really having a problem with this when we mistake in being thankful in all things for being thankful for all things. The text says, in all things, not for, but sometimes our mind will, will hear for all things, which just sounds crazy. I mean, it's hard enough to be thankful in all things, but to be thankful for all things, in all circumstances, when things are difficult and hard, especially in a year like 2020, where we've experienced loss and pain and suffering and the unknown is before us. Here's the clarity part. I did say, indeed, I did say, that the text tells us to be thankful in all things and not for all things. But let me be clear, it doesn't mean we can't be thankful for the difficult things. It doesn't mean we can't be thankful for the hard things in life. In fact, Scripture tells us to. See, I believe as we look at the Scripture that we'll, take, we'll, we'll level up from last week's message. Last week's message was about being content and thankful and, and grateful despite our circumstances. Now we're talking about being thankful, joyful in those difficult circumstances. If we can do this, we move from simply surviving in a healthy manner to thriving in an unexpected manner, in a manner that only can be explained by the grace and the glory of God in our life. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. Anyone want to take any guesses where we're turning? James chapter 1. I love doing passages of Scripture like this because... They're so familiar. There's part of me when I was a young pastor who thought, I don't want to go to familiar passages. I want to teach something new and unique that, that nobody knows so I could be seen as smart. But I realized something. 
that I know things that I don't even know that I live out in my own life, that I'm educated beyond my level of obedience. So it's important to sometimes just hit those things that are familiar because while it is familiar, are we actually living it out? As you turn there, let me give you a little background. James, uh, the brother of Jesus, most likely James, there's four Jameses in the New Testament, but uh, the, the belief is that it's the brother of Jesus. And he writes to, he says it in verse one, to the believers who were scattered, possibly the Jews who were scattered after the incident in Acts chapter 11, where they are scattered because of persecution. And he's writing to them, which makes sense when you hear what he's about to tell this church. Read with me James chapter one, starting in verse two. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Let me be clear this, what I would call pericope, which is my fancy seminary word I paid thousands of dollars for, uh, goes through verse 12, and we're going to kind of refer to the, to the rest of this passage. But the, the heart and the focus of what's on my heart today is from these few verses, two through four. Let's walk through it. See, verse two gives us a command to do something in difficult times. What's that command? To be joyful. Listen to it again. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for a great joy. Your Bibles may something, say something like, count it all joy. Now, this is not an encouragement to seek out difficulties. That's just crazy. This is not an encouragement to, to pretend that our difficulties are enjoyment or enjoyable. That would be lying. Instead, what he's saying is we should acknowledge the pain, recognize that this is difficult, be honest about it, because in that honesty and in, in saying this is tough, life is hard, things are difficult, it gives us the, the setting and the opportunity to do something that the world doesn't really do to do something that's counterintuitive, to consider it to be joy. But how do we consider it joy if we're not going to be dishonest or dis disillusion, disillusional? We are called to reframe what we're looking at, that rather than a negative, that this is going to be a positive. We're going to see that in the very next verse, to reframe our interpretation of those difficult things because there is a potential for those difficult things to do a good work in us and through us. Let's look at that verse, verse 3. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Here we see why Christians are to consider difficult circumstances as an opportunity for joy. Because the testing of your faith produces endurance. Your Bible may say perseverance when your faith is tested. Now some of you are saying, wait a minute, who said anything about a tested faith? He just said when, when things are difficult, when, when things are hard, but... Isn't our faith tested in those hard moments in life? Not testing as in like, do I, I, I'm being tested, do I even believe in God? Although that could be a part of it. It's not about believing in God, it's about believing God. Does he really love me? Is he really in control? Is he really in charge? Is he asleep? Is he cruelly just standing by and watching? Our faith in God, his character, his nature, gets tested in those moments and yet what we see in this text is that God intends for those moments to grow us. Now, I didn't say that God necessarily is the one creating those difficult moments, although there is biblical precedent for him testing our faith. Neither am I saying it's always the devil. Sometimes it's just simple, sinful humanity and living in a fallen world where we have difficult times. No matter the source or the cause, God intends to grow us. The word endurance, your Bible may say perseverance, speaks of a stamina to run the race. It makes our faith rugged for the long haul. You know what's interesting about this verse, verse three? Look at the very beginning of verse three. For you know that when you're... So, so James is not even telling them something they don't know. They know from just life that overcoming obstacles can make us stronger. That when a rock is beat up because the chisel keeps hitting it, that something beautiful comes out on the other end. When you go to the gym and you lift heavy weights and you make micro tears in your muscles, what happens? They come back stronger. And while we know this based on experience, while we know this based on observation, when we're in the midst of those difficult things, 
we act in ways which kind of reveal that we don't really believe it. Because we credit all that stuff as a negative, but here, it's a positive. This is the unexpected twist that takes place in the scripture. Most of us would say, you know, I understand that faith can endure despite difficulties. But this is saying faith is enhanced, increased because of difficulties. It's more than just faith becoming stronger and deeper through trials. It's because of those trials If that's the truth, then it certainly changes the way we see those trials and those difficulties and those hard things. It's not about surviving, but really thriving and all that God has for us in the difficult things that we walk through. And for that, we ought to be thankful. Thankful for those difficult times, the hard things in life. Let's take a look at verse 4. This shows us the results of this endurance. So let it grow. Let it grow. Let it grow. (laughs) That's not really in my notes. That's an ADD moment, but that's... He says, if this is what endurance does, then let that endurance grow. For when when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. See, we've already seen that faith tested is intended to result in endurance and perseverance. But that's not the final goal. The final goal of our endurance and our, and our perseverance, when we let it grow, is that it will be perfect, complete, and needing nothing. Now, first of all, some of you are thinking, wait a minute, perfect? We can't be perfect. We're fallen humanity. Only Jesus is perfect yet. Hold on. I, don't you love that I make arguing with you and you didn't even say a word? <laughs> that's another lesson from my marriage. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I argue. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Let me, observe, let me make some observations about this perfect, complete, needing nothing. The benefits of testing are the results of one's response to testing. You let it grow, which means you could also not let it grow. You can stop and not handle and not navigate that which God is using to develop and grow you. You can respond in the wrong way, or you can let it grow. That there is a result and you're participating by your response. Which brings the question, well, Jerome, what then is perfect, complete, and lacking nothing? The Greek word for, for, uh, for perfect here is teleos, which is translated perfect, which probably doesn't help you, but it's also translated mature. It's the same word Jesus uses when he talks to his disciples, and he says, hey, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, Jesus wasn't saying you have to become morally uh, perfect. You have to do it on your own. There's no way we're going to do it on our own. He sets a goal out there, a goal that we will never meet, but a goal that because of grace and what we have, because of what Christ has done on the cross, his righteousness becomes our righteousness. Therefore, we can be worthy in standing before God. But at the same time, there is a process by which we grow in our faith. And so he sets this goal, and James sets the same goal, the growth in perfection, the growth in Christ's likeness, and we continue to grow step by step, virtue by virtue, which is this idea that, that's, that's coming through here. We may not hit that goal, but we continue to be transformed into the image of Christ. One biblical commentary says this, Douglas Moo. You thought my last name was bad. His last name is Moo. Um, he's a professor at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Uh, Testing is intended to produce when believers respond with confidence and determination to endure a wholeness of Christian character that lacks nothing in the panoply, panoply, good word, look it up, of virtues that define godly character. When we respond with confidence in God and determination to endure the Christian character that defines what it means to be, you know, godly grows in us. There's a completion, there's a a maturity. And we see that in the life of Joseph in the book of Genesis. Joseph, you remember the story of Joseph? Some of you, maybe you don't. Joseph's the guy with a technicolor dream coat, right? Favored by his father, 
sold into slavery by his brothers. Then he gets into Potiphar's uh, home as a slave and he's betrayed, sent to jail. He interprets a dream. Pharaoh's cup bearer uh, totally forgets about him in, in there. And eventually, through God's providence, he becomes the number two man in all of Egypt. And then his brothers come because there's a famine looking for food, and he reveals himself through a long, I'm just, this is like the Cliff Notes version. It's not even, it's not even Cliff Notes, it's Jerome version, all right? It's very fast. <laughs> Big overview. But he reveals himself to his brother. His, his brothers plead for mercy. They plead for forgiveness for what they did to him. And he says this in Genesis chapter 50, verses 19 through 20. Don't be afraid of me for... Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. He brought me to this position so I can save the lives of many people. See, Joseph had eyes to see the hand of God in his circumstances, as miserable and terrible and difficult as they may be. He saw the hand of God working in him and through him. See, endurance had grown in Joseph so that the harmful actions that we would reject, he's almost saying, thank God that he worked the way he worked. I wouldn't change anything knowing what God has done. That's testimony. That's, that's a message that doesn't make sense to the world. God had used that whole journey, the trials, the difficulty, the rejection, to make Joseph mature and complete. See, you can be thankful for the hard things in life when you trust God is at work in and through you. You can be thankful. You could be joyful, like the text says, as you walk through it. Very, very, be honest with you, a lot of times thankfulness comes after the fact when we look back and we see God's hand. But a lot of it has to do with while we're walking through it. And we're going to talk about that here in a moment. Let me give you a couple examples of what difficult times can be viewed as. First of all, good medicine. See, if we're only thankful for the things that are comfortable, or if we're only thankful for the things that, that bring us pleasure, then we've made comfort and pleasure idols in our life. Hard things become good medicine because they purge us of our self-centeredness. Maybe I'm the only one who has self-centeredness issues. Some of you are like, amen. No, just listen, there's pain that sharpens us, that matures us. And that gives us clear eyes to see. So difficult times, the hard things in life, the things of 2020, or maybe that's not even 2020 related, the things of raising a teenager, the things of chronic illness, can be good medicine that accomplishes a God's supreme goal. Listen, let me talk about that next. Charles Spurgeon is the prince of preachers. You, many of you are familiar with Charles if you're not. Google them. He said this, health is a gift from God, but sickness is a gift greater still. The seminary that I graduated from has the collection of Charles Spurgeon's library. They changed the chapel that I went to chapel in uh, when I was a student there to just his library, the books behind glass, these murals of these paintings. And I remember taking the tour because I was, had been graduated for a while and they had made this change and I was getting pretty much a, a history of Charles Spurgeon. That guy was plagued with illness after illness after illness, and eventually he died young. And while he always prayed and hoped for God's restoration and healing, he recognized that God had a greater supreme purpose. See, it was in his pain that he drew near to God. He drew dependent on God, and in his dependence is what brought forth a powerful life in a powerful ministry. It's, his, it's, it's Charles Spurgeon's dependence, viewing the pain and suffering that he endured as a gift that allowed him to echo the psalmist in, who says this in Psalm 73, who am I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. My health may fail, my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. And if we say that and we really believe it, what is the work that God has, must have been doing in us and what can he work through us? See, you can be thankful for the hard things in life when you trust 
that God is at work in and through you. So what is it that we should do? What are some actionable steps as we leave this place? Let me give you three things. Not because three is like some holy preacher thing. I only have one point, but I have three like to-do list items. First of all, when the storm starts to, to, to blow and the waves start to crash, face that thing on this end of it with an anticipation that God is going to do something, with that trust that he's at work. Anticipate that God is going to do something. If we allow for the truth to sink in, that God is at work in these difficult things, that God is doing something in and through me, then we can face our circumstances with hope. We can walk into difficult things, and the, and the world will look at us. People who don't have the hope that we have will be like, I don't know how you have this perspective. And God receives the glory. See, we have something to look forward to. Yeah, things are hard. I'm going to be honest about how hard it is. I'm not going to lie about it. I'm not going to put on a, a fake smile. But I have hope that I'm about to witness God do something. We have a reason for our eyes to stay open, to observe and be tuned in to what he may do. If you could face troubles really believing what Paul says in Romans, that we know God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes, it changes the way that you walk and respond to those hard times. The second thing I would say is ask for wisdom. It's not just Jerome saying that. James says it. Go to the very next verse, just kind of to take a glance at it. Verse 5 of our text. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. Verses 5 through 8, James gives instruction to ask for wisdom. Now, this is not James on a rabbit trail. He's not talking about hard things in life and struggles and difficulties and then just going, oh, by the way, changing the subject entirely. Ask for wisdom. This, it's totally related. Ask for wisdom. It's not a wisdom that's just a general wisdom. It's not like, if you want to be wise like Yoda or Dumbledore or Gary Sobel, then you should ask for wisdom. It's, 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 it's a wisdom that's related in context to what we're talking about. Gary Sobel's not here, but he's there. I love you, Gary. It's a, it's a wisdom that's related to having the eyes to see. It's a wisdom that comes as part of the perfection, the completeness, lacking nothing. So you can't move forward into completion, perfection, lacking nothing with your endurance without divine wisdom. That's what helps us navigate it correctly. That's what helps us have eyes to see that God is at work. Then he gives us some examples in 9 through 11. If you just kind of glance at it really quick, he says that, hey, if you're poor and, and things are tough, with, with wisdom that's God-given, you're going to see that you're really rich. And if you're rich and things are tough, with wisdom you'll recognize that God has humbled you. And those things come with God-given wisdom, with divine insight. We see beyond the surfaces, beyond the surface of our realities. The third thing is this, celebrate what God has done. One of the ways that we cement what God has done. So I've kind of, we kind of looked at anticipate on the front end, in the midst of it, ask God for wisdom to see. Now we're looking at kind of on the other side of this, looking back, celebrate it. The problem that, the, the, that God's people had in the book of Judges and throughout the Old Testament is they kept forgetting what God had done. He did marvelous things. He split the Red Sea. They walked on dry ground. He did it again in the Jordan. They walked on, I mean like, he did incredible things, but over and over again you read, but God's people forgot. God's people forgot. One of the ways that we don't forget is we continue to recite and remember and recount and celebrate what God has done. This is where testimony comes in. This is where you write things down and you sit with your kids and you share, or your grandkids and you share. This is where you plant the seed in your grandkids and in your kids of trusting in him that God is faithful. And this is what strengthens our muscle for the next time difficulty rolls around. That we haven't forgotten that God is there and he's at work in and through us. 
See, it's on the back end when we really believe that God is at work in and through us in difficult things, we could be thankful for those things that we can say, I see God through it all. Looking back at uh, the beginning of 2020, um, we definitely weren't expecting <laughs> this year, as I don't think anybody was, but um, we had, you know, the normal resolutions. You know, we wanted to lose some weight and um, get closer to God. We wanted um, to try to become a tighter knit family. Yeah, in January, you know, it was just going to be another year, another normal year. Um, we knew that come February, my mom would have to have open heart surgery in February. So in January, we knew that that was coming, but uh, we didn't see COVID and shutdown come after her open heart surgery. So that was a complete blindside. <laughs> So having my mom home recovering from open heart surgery during the hottest part of the pandemic and the shutdown, with me still working and having parents coming in and out of the home and other children, and then Matt still working and being outside the home, there was definitely that concern of somebody bringing COVID into the house uh, and my mom being at one of the highest risks of COVID. So I was out one afternoon and I was running store to store trying to find toilet paper, paper towel, and face masks. Like everybody was looking and nobody was finding it. And I happened to run into a friend at CVS. His son plays baseball. And so him and Matt had coached together. And little did I know or remember that this gentleman sold uh, med supplies. Uh, so we were just chit-chatting and I told him what I was at the store looking for and why and he said follow me to my house and I'll hook you up. And I'm like no way. Like that totally felt like a God moment because I never see this family out and about. And so I followed him to his house and I called Matt. And I was like hey I'm not gonna be home right away. I'm running to Chris's house and Chris and Shana's house to pick up some gloves and whatnot and so he hands me some paper masks and he hands me some gloves and I was getting ready to leave he goes wait a minute I'll be right back and I'm like what am I waiting for so I waited and I waited and then he came downstairs with an N95 a brand new N95 and he said give this to your mom uh, for me the hardest thing during this pandemic was the fear of the unknown you know not knowing what's going to happen next. You know, are they going to enforce even essential employees to stay home? Um, and then probably more so than that was watching April taking care of the family at home with her mom's situation, with us going through all these changes with the kids schooling and them staying home all the time. and. I had to go to work, you know, I, there's, I, I'm limited to what I could do from work. Um, and because I never got sent home um, and I had to go every day, knowing that she was at home dealing with all that stuff and there's nothing I could do to help was really hard. I think one of the biggest thing that God has moved in our lives during this year, just providing for the family and giving us at times that we truly needed it, those those times where, hey, you're going to be all right. You're going to be taken care of. You know, there's been times that we were just so upset because we didn't know what was going to happen next. We didn't know if those needs were going to be met. And just knowing that we're going to be okay. Looking back, I can see God through it all. Looking back, I can see God through it all. These videos are, if you don't know, are, are people here at Radiant, they call Radiant home. And um, this whole series is, is really 
meant to build up to Thanksgiving Eve service. Uh, I intend to be here Thanksgiving Eve unless I can't. We're going to hear, have an opportunity to hear these stories a little bit more in depth, and we're going to have an opportunity to share what God has done, how we've been thankful in all circumstances, and even for the hard circumstances. So I invite you to be here for that. Let me read you the very end of this little passage as we close. Verse 12, James chapter 1. We kind of the bookend on James' discussion here. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Does that sound familiar? Kind of echoes Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount as he opens it up with the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. Listen to this, to the words of Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. See, one day we will look back and see the fullness of all that God has done in and through us. We'll, we'll understand and be thankful because we're going to see it clearly. But right now, we, we don't see everything quite clearly, but we do see there is a hope where one day there's a promise, but even now, I believe I'm in the middle of my life trusting God. But I can look back and I can say, God has been faithful. God has been so, so good. Thankful in all circumstances thankful for those difficult things that God is using because he's at work. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your truth to us. You revealed who you are. You revealed what it means to be your people. You revealed what you've called us to be and what you've called us to do. And part of that calling is to surrender and submit to your hand at work in our life. Father, I pray as we inch closer and closer to this Thanksgiving holiday that we will reflect that there would be an abundance of Thanksgiving that's found in the midst of difficult things in all circumstances. And that we would even level up and say, thankful for those things that God has used. In Jesus' name. Amen.